just clever make a good chiropractor? Are trusted, are ethical, are professional? What, what does the public want? Thank you very much for agreeing to talk to us um, uh, on, on, in your capacity as uh, Secretary General of the WFC. Um, this is a series of uh, interviews that we're doing to try and assess what the leaders of the profession think about the education framework that we have at the moment and what might happen ongoing. Because I think it would be useful, we're now trying in the UK to get more and more universities interested and we have got, been approached by universities elsewhere in Europe and worldwide and we want to try and get some sort of coordinated picture as to what the leaders of the profession think we, the direction we should be going in. So the first question I've got for you really is what do you consider makes a good chiropractor? What are the characteristics that you'd like to see if you were going to see a chiropractor? Well I think that's a fantastic question and uh, and there's no easy answer and I'm sure if you ask this question probably to another hundred chiropractors you would get probably a hundred different answers um, but I answer this really as uh, as 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 a clinician um, as a having having worked in practice for 25 years and uh, and from what I see in, in chiropractic around the world and uh, you know, I think that there are a number of a number of factors that are of, of, of critical importance, and uh, you know, I think there are certain things that, that are taken as a given, um, because you will have people say, "Well, it's so important to be a good adjuster, or it's so important to be a good diagnostician, or it's so good to be, uh, you know, you know, really smart at doing uh, at doing certain you know interventions." Now, I think if the education is right, um, chiropractors are going to graduate. With all of those things they're going to be good adjusters they're going to have the psychomotor skills to be able to employ manual therapy in in a range of, of scenarios they're going to be diagnosticians because they'll have gone through a good program um, of of uh, you know of, of diagnosis of pathology of of understanding you know the human the human condition and obviously as far as we're concerned neuromuscular skeletal conditions as well but does that really make a, a, a good chiropractor and and i'm not sure on its own it does um you know i was i was speaking at a at a commencement ceremony uh, last year and uh, uh, and i sprung on them the idea of of the continuum of uh, of clever smart whites and i think when you graduate as a chiropractor you're packed with knowledge you 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 are the repository of four years of facts of knowledge you've built up this 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 whole um, you know uh, load of knowledge that you can use. So you know you're pretty clever when you when you graduate. And I think well you know does clever make a good chiropractor? And it helps, but I don't think it's everything. Uh, and I think you're a few years in practice, and I think you graduate on the continuum from being clever to smart. Uh, which means, you know, you've still got the facts at your disposal. You still understand all the things that you've been told. You're still not out of college for long enough to have forgotten too much. But you're better at being able to apply that knowledge in certain scenarios because you have seen a load of patients and, and you can apply that knowledge. So you graduate from being clever to smart. But is that a good chiropractor? It certainly helps. And I think it's, it's great to be smart. But I don't think you've really reached the point that you really need to reach to be a good chiropractor. And I think that the, uh, the next graduation is to become wise. Um, so on the clever, smart, wise continuum, I think that, that, that when you're wise, you, you're not only got the facts at your disposal, you're not, enough smart, you're not just smart enough to be able to use them, but you also have that wisdom that comes with clinical experience over time. Um, and so I think that those those three things um, are, are an important continuum. That doesn't mean to say that you're not gonna be a good chiropractor until you get to 50 or 60 or 70. Of course not. There are other key factors, I think, as well in being a good chiropractor. And the other thing I often talk about is, you know, it's important to be intelligent, but emotional intelligence as a healthcare professional counts for so much more because I think it's not just a case of applying the facts uh, that you have uh, in your head. It's applying them to the patient that is sitting before you and it's treating the patient as a person. Um, you know, there's the famous expression that, you, you know, it's much more important to treat the patient who has back pain 
than the back pain that the patient has. And, uh, and I think that's very true. So I think gathering that and utilizing that emotional intelligence, understanding, listening to what the patient is telling you and seeking truly to understand that person is really what makes a good chiropractor. If you just have a set of tools in your toolbox and you're gonna throw that set of tools at every patient, regardless of whether they're a child, an athlete, um, you know, uh, a coal miner um, uh, or a retired person, then you know, if you're gonna do the same to everyone, then you're not a healthcare professional in my, in my reckoning. You're a technician and a poor one at that because you should be able to adapt to the individual that's before you. So I think that uh, situations where regardless of who the patient is, what they come in with uh, and anything else, you're gonna get the same treatment and the same recommendations. That's not being a good chiropractor. So uh, those are the things that I think are really most important. Well, I can, I can see, I feel a couple of acronyms falling out of that, which would be useful tools for people to remember. But anyway, thank you very much. That's a very good answer. Um, so the first stage of that is the education. Um, and we all agree, I think, that you need to have decent tools uh, in your toolbox before you do any of the um, application bit. Um, and so therefore, um, that uh, is very important. Uh, what do you think the future holds for chiropractic education? Where do you think it's going to go? I mean, uh, there are quite a lot of models out there at the moment. Increasingly, uh, the university sector seems to be playing a role. What do you think might be the way forward? Well, I, mean, I think the university sector, as you say, is, is, is increasingly uh, important. And I think if we're looking at, at, at the education of healthcare professionals, then I think increasingly we are seeing environments where there are a diversity of approaches, but, but one of the common themes is they generally have a range of programs for health professionals rather than, uh, you know, I think the, 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 the potential for seeing a dedicated um, chiropractic college on its own in the future is not necessarily a viable model. In the United States, for example, many of the educational uh, providers that were traditionally just chiropractic colleges have now diversified their offering um, significantly. You are, they've now gone into university status, they're offering a range of undergraduate programs, they're offering a range of postgraduate programs. So I think that seeing uh, a development in, in terms of university structure is certainly um, is, is an advent that's going to come. And I, and I see programs coming down the track and I think that there are, they're, they're going to be university based and there are a number of advantages to that. You know, no, one of the challenges traditionally in, in chiropractic colleges is the recruitment of faculty. And of course, you know, it, it is increasingly difficult, I think, to find faculty that are going to carry you through four or five years of chiropractic education. The advantage of being in a university setting um, which offers other healthcare providers is that if you're teaching basic sciences for example a you don't need a chiropractor to teach basic sciences but also you can recruit experts in those basic sciences who regardless of whether you're training to be a chiropractor a physiotherapist a doctor a dentist those basic sciences remain the same so you can you know there's a there's a model there that you can use the same faculty across the board and particularly have chiropractic students training alongside other uh, healthcare professionals. And we've seen that model as well. So I think that's one thing that, that is important. I think also, I think we're going to see a shift in chiropractic education from the traditional bums on seats, X thousands of hours over X number of years to a model that is based around or at least integrates competency-based education into its framework. I think people are going to start looking at healthcare education much more in the sense that uh, you start with the end in view. So what do we want a chiropractor to look like? What are the competencies that a chiropractor must have? What is the interprofessional knowledge that a chiropractor must have? You know, uh, what is the critical appraisal skills that a chiropractor must have? So we really need to, I think, start with the end in view. Really try to get an idea of what a chiropractor looks like and tailor programs so that those competencies are assured at the end of that, um, at the end of that program, rather than the traditional model of 300 hours of this, 400 hours of that. 
you know, it's, it's so important that we have the competencies there. And I think that's going to raise the bar for the profession. And, and I suppose, and sorry. I, I, I suppose that having experts teaching the basic sciences um, based around a university um, infrastructure means that the tools that they might have might be that little bit sharper as well, which is probably a good thing. Um, so you know, the, the, the basic understandings may be, um, uh, may, may be better delivered under that framework. That, that's, I, I get that as an as a advantage. The model that you talked about where they're training together, which I presume uh, the uh, Odense um, uh, Nike is the, is the sort of uh, model that you're looking at there, um, that must improve collaboration between um, chiropractors and other healthcare professionals. I see that as very important. Do you think there's a chance that might um, reduce the focus that people have on being chiropractors and make them more into sort of, if you like, medicalized chiropractic a bit too much? I've heard that criticism from some people. What do you think about that? Well, I, I think that is a, a criticism that, that we hear. Um, and, uh, you know, I understand why people might think that. But again, it's, let's take a step back. What, what does the public want? What, what does the public see as being a healthcare professional? Here we are now in 2020. You know, patients want their, want their chiropractors to be competent, well-trained, able to, to work within a healthcare team and speak to other healthcare professionals in a language that everyone understands, um, to have those, those technical skills. Um, and, uh, and, and really be experts in the field that we are best known for. I mean, you yourself, Peter, was on the, the, uh, was on the Identity uh, Task Force, which back in 2005, you know, declared that chiropractic were, chiropractors were, you know, spinal healthcare experts in the healthcare system. And, you know, whether, whether some people like it or not, that is yeah. what the public sees us, that is our identity. And so, you know, what does the public expect of a spinal healthcare professional? Well, they expect them to be educated, professional, ethical, skilled in, in, the, in the areas that they have. You know, does that make them, you know, medicalized? I don't think it does. I think it's, you know, there are certain core skills that are, that are common to all healthcare professions. Mm. And, uh, and the healthcare professions that don't do well or are seen as pseudoscientific, tend to be the ones that tend to depart uh, from that model. And so, you know, that doesn't mean to say that we shouldn't have an identity, we absolutely should. But I think if we start, you know, diverting into to, to what can be at times accused of being on the fringes of science, then I think that's where we start to struggle in being accepted as a profession, not just by the public, but also by the authorities um, who would otherwise look to uh, involve chiropractic in mainstream, mainstream care. Well, that's very interesting. And that leads me nicely on to the next thing, which is where you think the profession might be in 10 years time globally. I'm not talking about in any one, I mean, obviously everywhere is going to be a bit different and certain areas are further advanced than others. But a 10 year framework does give us a chance to speculate on what development might be. And uh, there you were talking earlier about the developments in uh, Malaysia. And yeah, uh, th there are certainly going to be other areas in the world where I'm sure it's going to develop. So I'd be interested in knowing what you think that picture could look like. Well, I, I, I really think that the status of chiropractic in 10 years time really does depend on what decisions and choices the chiropractic profession decides it's going to make. Um, it has to really understand what they want and what they want to be and how they want to be positioned. And that I think is gonna dictate where we end up being. It's absolutely the case that we have opportunities now and will have in 10 years time that we could never have imagined 20 years ago. When you and I first qualified as chiropractors, we would never have imagined some of the things that are happening now. Uh, I mean, we are, just this week, uh, we have had a group of chiropractors uh, that were nominated by the World Federation of Chiropractors, uh, Chiropractic to the WHO to take part in a development group for guidelines on low back pain. 
uh, and those chiropractors have been accepted. And one of those chiropractors is leading the group on developing guidelines for low back pain. So, you know, this is something but that, that, is, that is a, you know, unprecedented opportunity. You have chiropractors in the United States working within the Veterans Administration, you know, providing um, fantastic care and very valued care, you know, within that setting uh, of a very, um, very large group of people, but a group that has a whole diversity of, of needs. Um, we have chiropractors working in high level sport, chiropractors working at the Olympics, as you know, and chiropractors working uh, in other um, high level elite uh, athletic settings. You know, I think that those chiropractors who um, are willing to participate interprofessionally, uh, those organizations that are willing to talk to other organizations, um, chiropractors in countries that are able to talk in, in uh, talk sensibly with, with government agencies to secure legislation and to win trust um, are the ones that are going to survive in the future. And if you look at the examples now of countries where chiropractic has achieved um, you know, much more than, say, other countries, I think that you will see that they are the countries who've taken the right steps, not necessarily the easy steps, but they've taken the right steps to look towards legitimacy. And of course, government le legislation and recognition is a, is a big part of that as well. But we just need to do the right thing, Peter. Well, I like that very optimistic slant you've got, and I, I agree with it. I think that is the way forward, and I think that is where we will be. Um, I think we may find that there are some um, barriers that we don't anticipate as well. But anyway, um, uh, I, I wonder whether this pandemic will have changed the way people look at healthcare and look at um, the way they want to manage their well-being, um, and whether we might, if we're clever, be beneficiaries of a, of a slight change in culture. Who knows? But let's hope. Um, and I suppose if that is going to be where we're going, which is um, hopefully on a growth curve, but also something which is quite popular. Um, what do you think are the best tools for recruiting students? And I'm not talking about just saying it's going to be a great career. It's the sort of fundamental tools about how we go about making sure that we get the people into the profession who might follow some of the pathways that you've talked about, but also increasing diversity. It's still very much um, uh, uh, the diversity in the profession, certainly in the Western world, is not very evident. Um, I know that the gender diversity is quite good now, but certainly in the UK, the ethnic diversity is still not very high. So how do you think we approach uh, targeting and recruiting young people into the profession? Um, well, that, again, that's, that's an excellent question. And I think uh, there are, there's no easy answer to it. There's no easy route to you know, achieving the shift that I think that we want to see here in the UK. And, um, but I think that uh, one of the things that we, we need to do is, is we need to develop champions. Um, I think we need to have champions both within the profession, but we also need to have champions outside the profession. Because I think when, when young people are looking to go into a, into, a, into a profession, then people associate the profession with certain, or a profession with certain um, features. Uh, and I think trust is, is, one of the major, is one of the major components. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, I think people want to go into, into professions where they are trusted by the public. They have a good, uh, reputation, they have a degree of cultural authority, they see a trajectory for the profession that is moving towards being accepted by a broader uh, group of people than simply you know, enthusiastic patients. Um, so I think that when we're looking at the best ways of recruiting patients, I think recruiting champions who are trusted, uh, and, and this goes back a little, a, a little bit to you know, chiropractors working in elite sport. You know, there is the, 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 sometimes there's no greater endorsement than when a very well-known, well-respected, high-level athlete goes on the television and says, you know, I couldn't have done this without my chiropractor. You know, and that happened at the Super Bowl this year, actually. There was a, uh, you know, there, there, was, there were interviews that were undertaken 
um, you know, and, and clearly, I mean, the, you couldn't have bought that level of advertising for the profession or the level of trust that went with it. So I think trust and assurance are absolutely fundamental characteristics. And it's important that we promote chiropractic as an organization whose practitioners um, are trusted, are ethical, are professional, um, are, can work well with others. You know, I do, I often present a, uh, I, I present a, a lecture which is entitled Playing Nicely in the Sandbox. <laughs> and, it, and it really is about how we as a profession can get involved. And you and I both know, Peter, that, that, that when you work within a team of people and you are a trusted member of that team, you know, there is no better feeling. And, uh, you know, I think, I think uh, yeah, sometimes the isolationism um, has held us back to our detriment at times. And, and, so presumably, yeah, and presumably this diversity that we're talking about is supported and enhanced by a, di a diverse student body. So not just um, students who are studying chiropractic, but students who are studying other healthcare disciplines um, and from other backgrounds can help with us uh, in developing that diversity. Um, I think that's a very positive thought. Well, I think, I think one of the areas where we've probably seen, in, certainly in the UK, where we see probably more diversity than anywhere else is, well, aside from medicine, which I know is, is very, very diverse, is pharmacy. And, uh, and pharmacy in the UK has been very successful at, at promoting uh, diversity um, and, and opportunity within its, uh, within, within its, uh, its field. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I think partly that is in relation to um, generational factors. It is also, I think, in relation to the location of, uh, of institutions and, you know, the formation of London South Bank University is obviously a, a gives a great opportunity to, to work uh, positively uh, in that diverse community. But I think it's something that we actively have to promote. And in the WFC, we've done that very much in the last few years, but because, uh, you know, it's, it's an area where we've struggled. And uh, interestingly, you know, in, in terms of gender equality, I think we've done very well, as you said. You know, I mean, there is there is still uh, an imbalance in the United States, um, but I think in, in many of the institutions around the world, it is very much around the 50-50 mark of male to female. But it's the cultural diversity and making sure that as a profession, we are reaching everybody in society because ultimately chiropractic can benefit everyone in society, not just a small cultural uh, group. So that's really where we need to focus. Let's move from single figure percentage take up for chiropractic into the double figures. Um, and let's get nearer to 50 or even 100% acceptance. Okay, Richard, that's very kind of you. Thank you very much. Very considered and good responses. Um, I hope that uh, gives you a chance. To, I hope you're pleased with what you've explored. Is there anything else you'd like to mention at this stage before we close? Because we've got a little bit of time left. Well, I mean, I... I, I I've touched on it a lot. I mean, the, the, the direction that the World Federation is going in at present, we, we launched a new strategic plan last year, which is, which is designed around supporting and empowering and promoting and advancing the chiropractic profession. But there are, there are four particular themes that we've really focused on and we feel is where the success of chiropractic really lies. Um, and through each of those strategic pillars, we want uh, to promote the, the themes of evidence-based practice, um, people-centered care, interprofessional approaches, and collaboration. We, those four areas, or the EPIC principles, really underpin everything that the WFC is doing right now. Um, uh, if, we, if we don't follow every single one of those four principles, then I think we stand a chance of failing. But I think that these four principles are such that every chiropractor, regardless of whatever orientation or direction their practice may be in, can succeed with an evidence-based, people-centered, interprofessional and collaborative approach to chiropractic. So you will hear me talk about this a lot. You'll see the WFC talking about it a lot. Our conference last year was EPIC 2019. Um, and we are going to continue with this theme. We feel that it is of critical importance to the profession, but everyone can be a part of it. Every chiropractor on the planet can be epic. 
Yeah, well, there certainly was a lot of energy behind the EPIC conference in Berlin. And I'm very pleased to hear that that's a theme that's going to carry on because I talked to a lot of young people, young chiropractors, uh, and that chimes with their aspirations. So, and of course, you know, the, the best recruiting sergeants uh, are actually young chiropractors who have mates um, or contacts uh, and they can sell what they've decided to do to their colleagues. So thank you very much, Richard.